Okay, can everyone hear me okay with the mic there? Okay, I, um, if I hold it, I'm liable to turn, on, turn into a, like a stand-up comic and no one wants that, so it's, it's for the best that we don't go there. Um, but thank you very much for sticking around until 6 p.m., the last session of the day. Um, I appreciate it. Um, I'm a bit jet lagged at the moment. My flight was meant to arrive last night. I'm from Australia. It arrived today, so feeling a bit woozy, but I think that means that I'll be like very candid and honest maybe, and hopefully I'll remember my slide order. But anyway, I'm delighted to be here with you. Um, so on your Ocean's Eleven team, I'm the, I, the AI girl, but Guy has a, a bit of a ring to it. So, so that's the title we're going with. So our objectives in the talk today um, are to hack the casino. Um, specifically the AI, the artificial intelligence of the casino in question. Um, so we're going to start with a bit of um, open source intelligence and, um, and recon. We're then going to focus on the facial recognition AI and we're going to put it in the perspective of AI security. Uh, I'm an AI security person. I run an AI security company in Australia. Um, I've been working at the intersection of data science and cybersecurity for about 10 years now. I started in consulting. Uh, then moved to a startup. I worked in the Australian government and my PhD is in machine learning security. And then a year ago, I started Maleva. Um, I'm also online in various places at Harriet Hacks. Um, the social media content, I'm not really very good at, but you can find me on X, um, Instagram, TikTok. I, maybe you don't need to check out all of them, but um, you, you can find me there. We have a podcast. It's a, it's a whole thing, um, not to be totally cringy. So why the casino? Well, it's Las Vegas, why not? Um, the casino is a really good case study or analogy for every large organization at the moment um, who's grappling with this sort of tension of trying to adopt artificial intelligence very quickly, but maybe not necessarily feeling um, like they understand all of, the, all of the potential risks involved. And so obviously ca the casino is one of them and they have a lot of money, so they need to care about risk. Um, as do many other organizations. So some disclaimers, um, we had this particular casino's permission. Um, the attacks are real, but I'm not going to show you exactly how to implement them um, on you know, Canberra Casino's uh, AI itself. Um, and can I get a, a show of hands in the room of who would consider yourself maybe an AI person? Okay, and a show of hands for the cyber people. Okay, that's what I thought. So AI people, please don't come at me. This is more geared at cyber people who might not know that much about AI security, um, or it's meant to go sort of from a gentle zero to maybe 80. Um, I'll be giving this talk at DEF CON as well, and it'll go into a bit more of the technical detail. Um, but this B-Sides talk is a little bit more about the, the theory side, but, but with some cool attacks. Um, while I'm here, we're talking about um, Canberra Casino's permission. So as you can maybe hear from my accent, I'm from Australia. I'm from Canberra. Is anyone familiar with Canberra, Australia? Yes, I hear some, <laughs> some yeses. For those of you who aren't, it's our capital city. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people think it's Sydney. Um, but Canberra is our capital. It is our political capital, so it's very politically focused. Um, it's a bit like DC, but much smaller. So we have one casino. Um, and fortunately, <laughs> Casino Canberra were really, um, really accommodating and willing to work with me on this. So Can Canberra Casino is our city's best casino and our only casino, but don't let that deter you. They're, they're pretty good. Um, if you're listening, you're a great Canberra Casino. Okay. So um, for the non-gamblers among us, I think I went in with a certain set of expectations around how casinos would use artificial intelligence. Um, but um, I, I found that I, they weren't necessarily fulfilled. So, so let's just dive very quickly into casinos in general. Um, so they make a lot of money, so they need to care about AI risk, right? Um, they have a controversial history. Um, in particular, in Australia, um, some of our big casinos have been under quite a bit of heat lately for uh, money laundering and not complying with their regulations. I'm not saying this is true of Casino Canberra, but this is sort of the landscape in Australia at the moment. There have been some royal commissions. Uh, around the world, casinos have been um, known to have money laundering as a risk, you know, of, of being able to move money around. That's, that's sort of the nature of it. 
So um, in terms of, you know, using technology appropriately, it's something they really care about given the, the landscape that they're in at the moment. Um, they use artificial intelligence. Um, I thought that they might use artificial intelligence quite a bit for, say, detecting card counting or things like that. Um, I, I realized very early on that actually facial recognition and person identification was the most important use of artificial intelligence. Um, and there aren't that many providers of this kind of AI technology to casinos. Quite a lot of them um, are the uh, sort of casino chip um, and, and card providers themselves. It's a, it's a small landscape. Um, does that matter? Well, well, we'll get to that later anyway. Um, but facial recognition and person recognition are definitely the most important forms of AI. Um, and that's because card counting isn't illegal. It's considered advantage play, um, which maybe it sounds obvious. I didn't know that. Um, so you can card count, but you shouldn't do it conspicuously or you can get thrown out because the casinos are able to throw out anyone they like. Um, and so if you are um, you know, ostentatiously card counting and, and winning a lot of money, they really don't like that. Um, because the, like, sort of the, the algorithmic bias in, in the favour of the casino, um, like, what I also found interesting was that the, in terms of hacking an artificial intelligence system, um, that can mean a lot of different things depending on how you actually define AI. So here's the first bad joke of the day. So when I first told my mum that I work in AI, she said, oh darling, why are you working in artificial insemination? Because, see, see that gets a laugh. It doesn't get a laugh in a lot of crowds. Um, but she works in the medical profession, so for her, that's what AI is. And so for, I think, most of us, we would know that AI is artificial intelligence, but even so, we all have a slightly different idea of what that actually means. So maybe for some of the cyber people, um, as in terms of level setting, when I say AI security, um, people often interpret that in different ways. Often people assume it means AI for cyber security. Um, among the AI security folk um, that I sort of work with, um, in this context, AI security is the security of the AI system themselves. But that term does t tend to get muddied a little bit. So when we think about AI security as a field, it's more likened to sort of cyber security when you talk about the actual security of the, of the system itself. And in terms of the potential attacks and vulnerabilities in, in AI systems, um, these historically have come from the academic field called adversarial machine learning, which has been around for about 10 years. And the, the slide that should be showing is an example of an adversarial machine learning attack in the wild. So this is being able to add, for example, um, specially crafted pixels to an image or a specially crafted sort of material to an image that can prevent a model from recognizing it uh, accurately. So if you're able to add these perturbations to a stop sign, um, an AI system that's meant to be doing stop sign detection or, you know, object detection um, can be essentially hacked, you know, so it's disrupted or deceived so that it can't actually recognise the stop sign. So this attack sort of came to the fore with this classic example, which many of you may have seen before. Um, but this is from sort of 10 years ago. It's by this pivotal paper by Zegert and Goodfellow, not to get too theoretical or academic, but it's basically showing that you can add specially crafted pixels to an image, um, in this case of a panda, to prevent the model from recognising that panda and instead recognising it as a given instead, even though to a human observer, they see no difference. And these are specially crafted pixels. They're not random. There are lots of different methods to create these pixels. So in a computer vision uh, example like this, you can see um, that the, the noise we're adding um, is, is basically that, that sort of pattern. But all of these methods can be transferred to other fields as well or other domains that are a bit less obvious for humans to detect, like, uh, like audio, signals, uh, you know, things like RF, um, those sorts of fields. So this is this this field of adversarial machine learning is um, sort of the um, the origin of, of a lot of these offensive AI attacks. So offensive attacks on AI systems themselves. But when we think about actually hacking um, AI or whatever has been known to be uh, whatever has been referred to as AI in the past, we can go ba way back. And in the context of casinos, as long as people have been using algorithms or as long as organizations have been using algorithms, people have been finding ways to hack them. 
So if we think of an example that we would all know, things like email spam filters, you know, people have always been trying to evade those kinds of algorithms so that they can get spam through. In the context of casinos, a really you know, cool example, I guess, is from things like random number generators. Um, as we all know, random numbers do not exist in a computer sense. You have to have an algorithm that, um, that gives you the next number. And so there have been some pretty high profile hacks in the casino world um, in, in the 90s. Uh, for example, this um, particularly big one is from 1995. Ron Harris was employed by the Nevada Gaming Board, the, the, whatever that, that um, board is called. Um, and in 1995, he was able to predict the next numbers um, in, in a game of Keno so that he was able to win $100,000. Um, and he was, uh, he was found, you know, they're able to, to go up to his hotel room and, and find him. But there have been quite a few examples of these kinds of, I guess, hacks um, in the casino context. Another one you could really consider a hack in a sense is, is card counting itself. Because the whole idea is that the statistical um, nature of, of every gambling game we play means that the casino always wins, right? And this advantage that the casino has is different for every game. So things like the slot machines, it can be up to 25% uh, advantage to the casino. And the only reason that's limited is because of regulation so that it's not even higher. But in a game of blackjack, it can go down as low to 0.4%, uh, depending on the rules of the game. Um, and if you're able to play blackjack according to perfect strategy and then include card counting. So that's a way of you know, sort of hacking that algorithm as well so that you know exactly the right plays to minimize the, um, the favor in, in the casino. So thinking in terms of the adversarial machine learning landscape so far, so today, in terms of the number of attacks that you could implement on an AI system, there's over 100. Um, and this diagram, you don't need to worry too much about all the, all the parts of it, except that for every kind of attack surface you have in an AI sense, whether you're talking about um, a machine learning model like a convolutional neural network, which is a type of AI model that's really good at computer vision, so recognizing images, or something like a transformer down the bottom, which is very good for natural language processing. So I think things like ChatGPT. Um, they have different kinds of model architectures, therefore different kinds of attack surfaces, and therefore different kinds of attacks that are more likely to work at different stages of that attack cycle. Um, and these are just a few of them, but in things like MITRE's Atlas repository, which is the MITRE um, attack equivalent, but for adversarial machine learning, there are over 100 different kinds of attacks listed. So that's the landscape of, of adversarial machine learning um, for, for cyber people. So I assume everyone here has seen Oceans 11 or you are aware of the premise or Oceans 12 or 13 or 8. Um, I, I don't think I need to belabor it. Basically, it's a, it's a heist. So I thought, well, what better sort of narrative structure to have for a talk at, you know, in Las Vegas than to, to try and commit a heist? Um, and I'm not, you know, unfortunately, I don't have any George Clooney or Brad Pitt lookalikes in my team. Um, but the idea of this talk is to hack the casino AI that is most relevant to them, which I found was the, the facial recognition AI, um, to sort of get to my goal. And what that goal is, we'll, we'll also discuss a bit later on. So this is the process I went through. So first of all, we're going to interview the casino staff. We're going to pick our target models. We're going to implement the specific attack that I'm looking at, which is called a distributed adversarial region. We're going to disguise those regions in, in different ways. And then I guess we'll reflect on it and get some lessons learned or something. Um, so the first step, um, we want to do a bit of, bit of recon. We want to understand our environment. So what I do is I tell people I'm a PhD student doing a paper on, paper on AI security and I want to interview experts. This is very successful. I am actually a PhD student. I've been doing it part time for a very long time, um, like way, way too long, it's very sad. Um, but people are more than happy to chat to me about some of the most intimate AI security problems. Um, people are extremely candid. Um, I'm not saying that's necessarily true of, of Canberra Casino. Um, they were appropriately candid. But I've been doing these kinds of interviews with lots of different organisations. So Casino Canberra was one of them, which was sort of perfect for this talk. 
But over the course of the interview process, which is for the PhD and also for the company, so it's, it's sort of nice dual, dual use there, um, I've already done over 50 interviews of 43 different organisations. And it's all on the topic of sort of AI security and the potential vulnerabilities in their AI systems and whether they know much about their AI systems or their AI security risks. And as some, you know, initial um, insights, 94% uh, of those people in the organizations could articulate how they use AI. You know, basically every organization is using AI at the moment, but only 8% could articulate how they secure their AI. So ability to secure it from those adversarial machine learning attacks I was discussing earlier. So things that would disrupt, deceive or disclose information from their systems. Um, there's a really big gap there. Now, that's not necessarily the, the case for Casino Canberra. For, for them, they're, they're at an interesting inflection point where, you know, big casinos, so the, the kinds of casinos that are in Las Vegas, um, already implement facial recognition AI and many other kinds of AI um, as per course. Like the, the, the building has been designed to be inherently um, AI-able, you know, the, the way that the architecture is, you know, you have to walk through certain corridors at some point, that's to make sure that the facial recognition cameras can, can find you, the, you know, where you're able to park your cars, um, just the different thoroughfares, uh, in addition to all of the sort of psychological tricks that are done to keep you in the casino, um, are there because surveillance is inherent in how you experience the casino. Um, and it was pretty clear early on that facial recognition is the most important way they do this. Even for things like money laundering or card counting, it's not necessarily the AI that is you know, detecting that, but it's the responsibility of the dealer to be able to identify what's going on, identify dodgy people, and then alert the casino so that they can then put it in their facial recognition AI systems. So this is by far the most important use of facial recognition AI. Um, for those casinos that haven't been able to fully adopt um, that kind of AI yet, it really still relies on their people. So you still have rooms full of people surveilling cameras in real time and trying to um, hope that they catch the right people based on um, you know, manual processes, which is really hard. And obviously this is, um, you know, less likely to catch as many um, people or entities as an AI system would. But then, um, you know, there's, there's the whole privacy trade-off there too. And just as every organisation is, you know, trying to adopt artificial intelligence at the moment, that's true of casinos, um, it's very expensive. Um, and they really have to sort of make that judgement based on, um, you know, how profitable they are. So Casino Canberra is going through that sort of inflection point too and that decision-making process. So we moved to step two and now we're choosing a victim model. So there are lots of different uh, sort of surveillance AI providers out there. Um, these are some open source facial recognition models that exist, just a few of them. There are many. Um, I could also create my own sort of custom model. Um, but at the end of the day, they're all pretty similar because they all are for image recognition. And so they therefore all use this particular type of AI model, a uh, machine learning model called a convolutional neural network. Uh, and at the end of the day, that's basically a model that's based on the way that humans are able to identify faces and objects as well, um, based on our brain structure. So we have input data, it goes through a sort of model of, of neurons and synapses between them, and then we're able to predict uh, who someone is or, or what they are. Um, and so in a machine learning sense, that's very much the same too. You have neurons connected by different layers, and there's a training process so that based on historical data, you can predict future output. So regardless of how um, you decide to, I guess, customize your model, um, at the end of the day, they all rely on the specific architecture and a very similar training process. And so what this means from an AI perspective in terms you, of how you actually um, predict what a face looks like, um, it sort of compresses in a mathematical sense into this space called an embedding space. So all of the higher dimensional data that is captured about faces, um, if we were to display it as a 2D image here, or if you could imagine it in 3D, it's basically like different clusters of features that are, that are similar. So in facial recognition, for example, it's very much based on the geometry of the face. So how close people's eyes are, what kind of shape they are, 
um, relation to the rest of the face. And so you end up with different clusters based on different features you're looking for and based on how similar the clusters are, um, a model is able to make a pretty good prediction. The other thing that's unique about talking about artificial intelligence models versus you know, a, a cyber system is that if you're thinking about a model, um, you, you usually refer to its, its sort of evals or um, you know, lots of different factors, you know, statistical, mathematical, that tell you how good it is at predicting something. So here we've just got accuracy. And these are a few examples of open source facial recognition models and how accurate they are. So they're all pretty accurate. Um, they're all over 97%. Most of them are close to 100%. Of course, how you decide to test this um, is, a, is a question. These are sort of based on um, research papers that, that benchmark these kinds of models. Um, however, uh, the thing about machine learning models is that because they all rely on that same convolutional neural network architecture, you end up with these models that converge to the same kinds of features and representations, um, no matter who is building that model or, or what organization is creating that process. Uh, research has shown that actually, if you're comparing uh, clusters of models or similar models that are designed to do similar things, they are 95% similar to each other, at least. All of the, the numbers range from 95% to 99%. So what that means is that if you take two models created by different organizations, by different researchers, if you were to compare what they look like on the inside, they are 95 to 99% similar. And this is true of uh, you know, models created by companies that represent their IP. There's only so many things you can change about a model if it's designed to do a certain thing. So this is an interesting point. But for us, this principle of convergence makes it really easy to attack models because I can create a model that is almost identical to any other model and then create an attack and launch it um, against that victim based on the surrogate model. Because the same data plus the same training type basically equals the same model. So the third step is I'm going to create what's known as distributed adversarial regions. And this is the attack that we're implementing here. So here's just an overview of some different kinds of adversarial machine learning techniques that have already been tried in, in the wild. So we've already got that, that panda image there. The, the one in the middle is these adversarial glasses. So someone is able to uh, not be recognized by facial recognition or, or person recognition by wearing um, either glasses with this special adversarial coating or a jumper with an adversarial pattern on it as well. Um, the last image I like to show because it's funny, but basically the, the one with the cardboard box over the person is a, a study done by DARPA, or, or rather DARPA created a person recognition model to use in um, sort of urban camouflage environments. Um, and they asked a team of their Marines to try and hack the model. And basically they were just able to act like not people and defeat the model. Um, so they did things like hold branches and wave them over their heads and put, you know, cardboard boxes on, them, on their heads. Um, so anything they did was, that was a bit outside the norm was able to hack the model. Um, which I like to show because I guess it's not really a sophisticated attack, but these attacks do still do work. Um, now, is this attack a sophisticated attack? I guess it depends. So this is a, an attack that I created um, for specifically urban camouflage settings. Um, so the research that I do, um, well, I started when I was working with the Defence Department. So a lot of it was sort of very focused on sort of military applications and the national security context. And so the idea is that you would be able to apply the specific attack to, um, to urban camouflage environments. So this is the methodology for those people who are methodologically inclined or like a good diagram. But basically at the end of the day, I'm testing, uh, I'm taking an image of, of something. So a, a ship, for example, here, um, identifying a region in that image or in that sort of that, that video that is most likely to cause a misclassification. And I test it by applying different kinds of adversarial machine learning methods to that region, um, testing different models. And then from there, I can apply it to lots of different sort of case studies and settings and, and kinds of objects. And so the, the point of this specific attack is really that I want to see how I can, instead of having to perturb, say, the actual ship, 
or an object that's being classified, how I can add regions, so distributed regions, to this environment that prevent the model from recognising what that object is without having to actually change anything about the object. So, for example, if I'm looking at a ship, can I add adversarial buoys around that ship that prevent it from being recognised by um, image recognition models? And you can. You can do the same for, for planes um, and for other kinds of military platforms as well. And the, the reason that you would like, want to do something like this, even if you're not actually, um, you know, even if a human can recognise that maybe something there is a bit different, is because in a lot of settings you don't always have a human in the loop or you don't have a human in the loop until a lot later in the process. So it's more about disguising something like a, you know, a platform like this from some sort of automated detection. So because I'm a researcher, unfortunately you have to end up with sort of graphs that look like this um, as part of the, the testing process. So what we're really doing is we're testing the extent to which um, applying these distributed regions to an image are uh, likely to um, reduce the confidence level of a model in what it's looking at. So, um, for example, if I were to um, place some distributed adversarial regions around that ship, it would reduce the confidence that a model has that it's a ship by, say, 40%. Um, and the we, we did find that applying these regions to those sorts of objects decreases the probability by 40.4%. But I'm applying this to casino facial recognition AI. So this is a very unflattering picture taken of me, um, walking up to facial recognition detection. And using this region, I want to try doing things like adding jewelry. Design is maybe to be, you know, um, could be better. Oh, come on video. Hang on. I downloaded it over here. So this is um, what this sort of, what this ends up looking like. So I have a demo here. This is just um, implementing the attack against one of these open source models. If you're not a code person or you're not really familiar with machine learning code, the point here really is that you can do this in a minute or so. So you don't need to worry too much about what the code represents, apart from noting that we're taking this open source model, we're applying, we're, we're creating the perturbations based on different, um, different targets. This time it's me and my face. I'm testing adding different um, jewelry um, around my face. And I wanna see if I can prevent that facial recognition model, um, fine tuned on images of my face as well, um, to prevent it from actually recognizing me. So I know this is really exciting, but <laughs> you have to include a code demo, right? Um, so here it's shown that there's a match found. So that's me testing the clean image of me without any of those perturbations. It was able to find the match. That's that original image. And then I'm going to test the new image, the one with the adversarial regions applied. And we're going to see if there's a match or if it loads. As a spoiler, there was no match. So <laughs> just does that add to the suspense? I don't know. Um, so I guess we could say that we hacked the AI, right? We were able to prevent it from recognizing me. Um, we certainly want to test it. We want to see the extent to which we're able to decrease the confidence of a model in predicting and recognizing me. And the number that we end up with is, like I said before, 40.4%. So for the images that that model was tested on, the confidence in being able to uh, correctly predict what it should be was decreased by 40.4%. So I had a real problem, problem like trying to actually describe this as a, a hack, you know? Uh, I think the challenge in applying cybersecurity kinds of terms and methodology into the world of AI security is that machine learning models are inherently probabilistic. 
So it's not like you'd necessarily have a, a binary answer at the end of the day, or, or you might, but it'd be more scientific to test it multiple times using you know, the multiple different variables and, and different kinds of images. So maybe I'm able to prevent that model from recognizing me once, but on the whole, it's more about actually reducing the likelihood that it is able to predict who I am. And the, the tough thing about applying this to facial recognition is because, in, is because it, you're more likely to sort of bound the face. So to look, the model will only look for features within this sort of bounding box in my face, whereas other images are more likely to rely on context. For example, um, like that, the, the water behind the ship um, helps the model understand that that's a ship. Um, so I kind of hope that it would be better. Like I hoped that it would, you know, that the results would be, I don't know, more shocking or more interesting or just more of a, a hack or an attack. Um, so I sort of, I was a little bit disappointed. I had to take a pause. I did, you know, what you always do when you want to run away from a problem and that is I went on a trip, I went to Europe, it was lovely. Um, and then I realized that the problem with my sort of disappointment in the attack was the same problem that I'm always encountering in my, my work. And that's that most of the organizations that we work with really talk about adversarial machine learning in terms of attacks and defenses. So all the different kinds of attacks that could be employed against a model and you know, versus all of the different kinds of defenses that should also be applied to that model. But that's not really the right way of framing it because in cyber, you don't really talk about cyber attacks versus defenses as you know, the, the, the be all and end all. You really talk about maturity and risk. And so an organization has to understand their, you know, their risk, their highest priority assets and targets, and then decide the priority mitigations, right? And that's not something that is historically talked about in the world of AI security, even though it should be. Like, that's the point we want to mature to. So the questions that we really want to be asking, if we're trying to hack this facial recognition model, is, you know, what, what is the target? What am I trying to steal? If I'm bypassing a facial recognition AI in a casino context, why is that? And, you know, if we're sort of generalizing this and applying this to any organization, that is a question that every organization needs to ask. But if we think about it from the casino context, it really means that, you know, someone is possibly a money launderer or a card counter, and you just want to do that and not be recognized and taken out of the casino. And if that is the goal, maybe go to a casino that doesn't have facial recognition AI. Um, is the first thing. The next question that we need to ask in this context as well is, like I prefaced before, what does it mean to hack an AI model? It isn't really the right terminology to use when, if we're thinking about risk in a cyber sense and thinking about all the risks that a system might have in terms of you know, the system as an attack surface, um, just so it's more about the risk that an AI system is going to cause a misclassification rather than the risk of an AI system in its entirety. Because many AI systems can do the same thing, but there currently isn't any regulation or really understanding. There's certainly no requirement to have any research or open source information um, or closed source information about how robust those models are. So just because a model can perform facial recognition pretty well, um, all of the different models we tested were extremely variable in how robust they were to, um, to an attack like this. And that's because, as I say here, a machine learning system is inherently probabilistic. It's, it's not deterministic like many of the cyber systems we're used to dealing with. Um, and the last thing, as I've said before, is what are we trying to protect? Um, we're trying to protect the casino's money, their profit, their brand reputation, um, all of these things, but thinking about it from the perspective of risk. Um, because an AI attack, an attack on an AI system is just part of the kill chain, right? It's not like we really think about um, having one attack that's powerful and able to do everything. It's more about all of the different ways that you could alter this attack depending on the um, depending on your target or the particular case study. And the way I like to think about it is in terms of a Stuxnet style attack versus a DDoS attack. 
uh, because many adversarial machine learning attacks tend to fall into sort of a Stuxnet style. They're very cool, they're very complicated, they're able to, you know, deceive an AI system in, I guess, a really cool way, you know, a way that a researcher can be like, uh huh, this is a cool attack, right? Um, but at the end of the day, it's actually maybe the these sorts of attacks that are that are here um, that aren't quite so cool to an AI person, maybe, but are actually able to disrupt almost all models. Um, maybe not in the, you know, maybe I'm not able to get the model to think that I'm Angelina Jolie rather than Harriet Farlow, but I'm able to cause a misclassification almost all of the time just by disrupting it. And that is far more likely to have an impact to a casino um, or to an organization. Um, because even though that, you know, that, that number that was 40.4%, which is a bit disappointing, if you're able to change that attack, if you're able to think about all of the adversarial machine learning attacks that are out there and apply that as part of your existing cyber kill chain, the success rate is 100%. So this is the kind of you know, thinking that needs to happen in the field of AI as well. Um, all of the, the other sorts of creative ways that you could apply something like a distributed adversarial region in the facial recognition context, um, you know, things like pimple patches, being able to, if you have access to the actual camera and being able to stick like a clear piece of sticky tape with that adversarial region in it, depending on all of the different, you know, points of access you have to a system, those are all things that could be done. The other reason I really like the casino context is because it's all about surveillance and it's about surveillance by design. And as we're moving as a society to having artificial intelligence that is uh, increasingly being adopted, that's something that we really need to consider because our societies are increasingly becoming surveillance by design. Um, and whether this is a good or a bad thing is, you know, a, a discussion for lots of people, including, you know, sort of thinking about policy and regulation. But if we think about the casino as an interesting test bed for this, then all of the different ways that facial recognition is being used now in airports for, you know, social credit scoring, for surveillance, for policing, um, there are all sorts of reports about how minimally robust these models can be. Um, that there's no requirement for how robust they need to be at the moment. Um, because AI security is real. Th these are some statistics from a um, company we love, Hidden Layer. Um, they released this report that shows um, lots of different things about the reality of AI security, but 77% of companies reported identifying breaches to their AI in the past year. This is massive. 96% um, of IT leaders express that their AI projects are critical, which we can all you know, uh, understand, right? Everyone's talking about AI at the moment. Um, this is a real attack. So even though being able to evade facial recognition AI is, you know, is possible and scary, at the end of the day, uh, it's in the context of the process that it lies within and the people who are making those decisions in the process that I encourage all of you to think about as well. Um, even in your roles as cyber people or, you know, whatever kind of person you might be, what kind of role you have, it's more about being able to bring all of the different disciplines together so that AI can also mature to the extent that it needs to be given just how widely it's adopted at the moment. And if we really think about it, um, I was able to reach out to Casino Canberra through my, you know, PhD, I shouldn't put that in credit, I am a PhD student. Um, and I asked them very kindly if I could go into their casino and sit there and film myself hacking something and they said yes. So. At the, at the end of the day, um, it's more about the cooperation and, you know, what does it mean to hack an organisation, right? So this is a bit of the um, sort of the, the theory of these attacks. Um, I'll also be talking about the same stuff at DEF CON. Those talks will go a little bit more into the technical detail of how it worked. Um, I also have another talk at DEF CON in the Policy Village about my experience working um, in an intelligence agency uh, in Australia. So you can come along and hear all about that too. The things that I'm allowed to talk about, of course. Um, so please do stay in touch. I hope you found this interesting. I think there's some time for questions. Um, I should add, I'm also looking for survey participants for this um, AI security interview. Uh, so if anyone would like to be interviewed, um, please do. If you have a question, raise your hand, and I'll bring you a mic. Um, I was 
at DEF CON 26 a while ago. Um, they had a similar talk. Does everybody just roll their own, or does there exist an existing package for this DARS? That, that's a good question. So, like I said, there's over 100 different kinds of attacks, and a lot of the time they're based on the similar, like the, the same principles, right? It's an optimization algorithm, and you're optimizing between different constraints. So, uh, whether it's trying to affect a misclassification in an, in an image sense, or if you're trying to um, like cause a specific targeted misclassification, it is all just optimization at the end of the day. So you can easily code it from scratch. Um, but there are pre-existing packages that help you implement adversarial machine learning attacks as well. Uh, just curious, throughout the course of your research and conducting some of these uh, modifications to like the Jupyter notebooks, was there any um, attempt or situation where you were able to actually uh, go live with those uh, modifications to the artificial intelligence or was it just through the modifications of the uh, Jupyter notebook that you were able to see that the, the image was misclassified? Um, so to understand your question, whether we're able to test it in like a live environment, um, not quite yet. We've been sort of conscious of Casino Canberra not really wanting to do that. Um, we are sort of working with some companies that do look at the bio biometrics and, and testing some of that now. So the, for example, the urban camouflage um, research that we were doing is applying the pixel alterations digitally, but to sort of things like videos. So in theory, you could apply exactly the same pixels in real life, um, just like those stop sign examples, um, if you're able to, um, and you can sort of dynamically alter them as well. Uh, since you mentioned that surveillance is a big field for this type of technology. Do countries try to make bypassing these AI facial recognition tools uh, illegal? Or do they, be for me it's currently difficult to imagine to make it illegal, that you are wearing weird earrings, uh, weird mm. hat, etc. But are there movements into that direction or is it even illegal in certain contexts? That's a really good question. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's nothing that's illegal about wearing something that could disguise you from facial recognition. Um, the question, I mean, insofar as you're able to exist in a society where it's mandated, I mean, I guess there's nothing stopping you from um, walking up to the facial recognition AI at an airport and like wearing weird glasses, but then they ask you to take it off, you know? So insofar as you are sort of forced to interact with AI in the various ways that you interact with your life, um, that, that's sort of the requirement you have. It would be interesting to see if different jurisdictions did try and regulate something like that. Um, yeah, I'd be curious to see. Hmm. So yeah, great talk by the way, that's really awesome. Uh, curious, can you speak to any of the other algorithms that might be used to, to, as like layered defense against these like design basis threats where maybe the lighting in the room modifies the algorithm in some significant way or other types of uh, behavioral tracking such as the time of day the person might frequent the casino, the way they walk or any other kind of handicap mm -hmm. or other significant mm -hmm. item? Yes, absolutely. So. The, in casinos, um, they don't really have, um, well, well, most of them wouldn't rely on um, sort of behavioral patterns like that. Other kinds of systems would, so other AI systems that are forced to rely on, uh, you know, time-based decision-making or sort of more, more behavioral information like that, um, that casinos wouldn't be a case study for that. But where those kinds of systems do rely on other information like that, um, yeah, I mean, you could alter the time of day that you frequent a place or change your behavior in some way, just like sort of traditional algorithm hacking. Um, th those models that do rely on pattern of life kind of stuff. Um, I guess that's already, d did I understand your question? Um, 
Uh, you did. I think there was a good prelude to it. Um, I, I guess what I'm kind of getting at is, is do you incorporate other forms of AI or ML to defend the inefficiencies of the facial recognition technology? Would that be kind of the the casino secret sauce, so to speak, where they're able to fine tune the open source algorithms in some way that makes them more effective? Uh, yes, no, definitely. That, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, if a casino were able to incorporate other kinds of decision making um, to to make the facial recognition or the, the person identification more accurate, that would be ideal. Whether a casino is the right, you know, whether they decide that that's something that's worth investing in based on the potential money they could lose, I think would be, I, I personally wouldn't know if that cost equation would work out. For fields though, like policing, where it's extremely important that you're able to identify the right person, they do already add other kinds of decision-making intelligence there as well. And there usually is a requirement to as well. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, my question was just related to the vectors that you tried. You focused on um, the jury in, in this talk and you mentioned sort of those pimple patches. Mm -hmm. What other sort of mechanisms did you look at? Did you, you know, get a temporary face tattoo? Like what, what, what other sort of things did you consider? Yeah, I, I would have liked to try something like that. I think the thing with a temporary face tattoo or something big like that is that it's akin to the DARPA example where it's not really an AI attack um, that's more just about not being as you normally would be. So, I mean, if I were to wear like a ridiculous hat or wear face paint or something, that would obviously also prevent the model from recognizing who I am most of the time. Um, but then is that sort of fair in terms of this research? Probably not. I think the idea is that it's um, sort of at that, at that boundary where someone could be like, huh, that's some interesting earrings, but not something where someone would really care, you know. Um, I liked that you kind of highlighted the very grey line between like the fitness for purpose of the algorithm and the ability to quote unquote hack it. Mm. Organiza organizationally speaking, who owns this problem? Is it a data science problem or a cybersecurity problem? Oh, that's my favourite question. Um, <laughs> because every, every organization we work with, that is the question that no one asks. You know, usually we go in and we find that the executive level thinks that the IT team is handling AI security, that the IT team think that the AI team or the data science team is handling it, they think that AI, the IT team is doing it, no one's doing it. Um, some, some people are, but you know, on the whole, no one's really thinking about it. All the owners are people who don't know a whole lot about it. You know, often those owners might be cybersecurity people who've been given some rudimentary AI training. And, um, you know, it, it's great that they're being invested in, but cybersecurity is a very different sort of discipline to AI security. So it's often very hard on those teams. Um, it, it's a discipline in itself. And there's a lot of crossover between cybersecurity and AI security, but not enough that you can just expect a cyber team to know what to do. So yes, it's a big organizational problem because um, either organizations think it's not important or it's not a real risk, or they think that their existing teams are fully capable of dealing with it, or um, they're just not sure that's the right thing to do. So it's a good question. All right, that wraps it up. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone.